Welcome everybody. So a handful of us will be off to EuroBSEcon, including John and company. And uh, for example, Daniel, I very much specifically wanted to invite you as a production user to describe some of the real wish list items we want to have knocked out before, say, FreeBSD 13.2 and 14 and the next cuts of Illumos and you name it. So Andrew, my apologies sure. in advance if this will be pretty FreeBSD oriented, but hey, we, I actually want to hear every single wish list item you have relating to Illumos. Do, wait, hang on. Do I get that correct that you're going to EuroBSD? Yes, sir. Michael, okay. So you will be going. Okay, very good. Uh, so will Jan. Jan and I tried to come up with this MikroTik card uh, that's like a, what, a router on a card and a thing and a thing, but uh, they're backordered and I keep on and off forgetting about it. But anyway, so yeah, uh, that's uh, the kind of thing we want to just, you know, try to advance by having a bunch of people in the same place at once, which hasn't been happening lately for some weird reason. Anyway, uh, feel free to jump in, anyone with the most passionate concerns and desires. Oh, come on. So, well, I think the, well, I think the most exciting thing for, uh, um, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the reasons I might, uh, think for five seconds about, uh, using VMware would be the suspend resume migrations. So, uh, you know, I know, I know there's been, there's been some work on that. I don't know if that's realistically a three, two or, or, yeah, or 14, FreeBSD 14 thing. Um, but that would be, that would be pretty great to not have to shut down a, a system between migrations. So that would, that would mean, I guess, a, you know, a memory snapshot uh, functionality um, with a suspend. So, um, yeah, there's been, there's been some progress on that though, right? Yes. And Patrick went wild with his own approach. So that might even be something that can be brought back to FreeBSD. And those who missed the last call, this is of interest. You, if you're on the dock, just scroll down. Uh, Elena mentioned that some of their students are graduating, which is one of those things in academia. And some of their work is perhaps getting shelved. So it's been rebased relatively recently, but that could use a few of the examples there could use some love. Uh, Is I there anyone around they could um, deliver a brain dump to while it's still available? That is a very good idea. Just have someone already familiar with Beehive code talk to them before they uh, scattered into all uh, four directions. That's a very good idea. Okay. Doesn't John Baldwin pretty much keep in touch with them on that stuff? So he should actually have a pretty good idea what they're doing. Yes, but he already has a bottleneck for beehive development. <laughs> got that but i mean that this again lost information being the key if john has it it's not lost information okay and to not to hop around too much but we probably will to daniel's point jan you had follow-ups on suspend and resume being the priority rather than host my upgrades was it um, and my go question ahead and elaborate. is what did he want to uh, suspend or resume between basically does he do you want to suspend a guest reboot the host for kernel patch and then restore or do you want to migrate between different host systems for for my my situation, which is sort of like a you know managed cloud thing where all of my clients mm -hmm. have different things, it's it's probably more likely to be for a, a migration. So so you know either client migration. DFS, yeah yeah. So like you know so if the uh, yeah just so like you could 
start pinging on one box, move it to a new mm-hmm. host and resume pinging on the, on the next box. That's a, mm-hmm. you know, a trick that, uh, you know, people like to see on like Proxmox and VMware. Sure. But, um, and um, it, so you, are you considering this for um, load balancing to m- move tenants to uh, as few boxes as possible or to, uh, move away noisy neighbors or what's uh, it's it's probably more for so my use case is really for survivability so i you know i can i might be able to take a you know i'm if if i can limit the amount of if i can not do a reboot like i could move a you know a domain controller or a you know or or a linux chat system or something like that and then you know it's it's just another x seconds that the box doesn't have to go down if i can mm-hmm. sync the memory as well um so yeah it's it's really it's really for me it's about it's it's about uptime and if i need to reboot a host or the host is running low on resources then then that would be you know, a, a more ideal way to do it than, than a shutdown ZFS send and, and restore, which is what I'm doing now. And that works in really 95% of cases. Um, but there are databases and things that like take a, take a lot of time to come back up. Of course, that also means that they have huge amounts of memory, which is really annoying to sync. Yeah. And makes, I mean, it's, it's less, it's, it's, I, I will say that the VMware Proxmox, you know, flex of, of doing this is a lot less useful than it looks at first, because if you have a box with, you know, 120 or a VM with 120 gigs of memory, it's completely useless <laughs> to do this. It's, it's well, really not, depends. it's much better to just shut it down or have a, you know, have an application layer replication. It's not really doing you any good uh to 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 perform live migrations and like this but but it is it is something it is definitely something that stops me it slows down my um my upgrade process from 12 to 13 from 13 to 13 one i'm okay. not going to want to reboot uh because i've got some vms that i just can't shut down because the the clients need them up and they shouldn't be down for, for more than 60 mm-hmm. seconds, and it might take more than 60 seconds to boot. Um, the problem with what you're asking for is that it's one thing to implement uh, migration between identically uh, built hosts, like same FreeBSD user and in kernel version, same CPU microarchitecture. It's something very different to migrate f- between d- from an Intel to name DCPU and from FreeBSD 13 to 14 or something. Well, even, right. even VMware tells you they won't do that. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, VMware won't even necessarily do it between different, different CPUs and the same vendor. Yeah. Right. But right. Uh, at least, so it's not. So a, I guess, yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, for, I guess I do use matched pairs or tend to use yeah. matched pairs, but yeah. I mean, I, I feel like that, this is this is one of those requests that, you know, if it's imp, you know, when implemented, would have caveats around it. But I think those caveats yeah. are probably okay. They are okay for real production users on well-designed production systems. They tend uh, to bite uh, loud uh, hobbyists then complain right. that everything is terrible, similar to the, oh, some uh, users who will shout uh, that ZFS is terrible because uh, MD RAID can just uh, migrate between RAID levels. Oh, my RAID array is gone because uh, I lost the disk while migrating between RAID levels. Uh, yeah, so right. this needs very clear communication if it's ever implemented on what's supposed to be possible well Daniel, okay sorry. let's take it down yeah so let's let's then you know just just incrementally speaking i think that the that the goal and this this would you know and you were you were pointing this out before is suspend 
upgrade the host, reboot the host, and then resume. Yeah. And then that's that's, the, that's something that's a that's a more realistic 13-2 goal, perhaps, or at least 14 goal. And that's that's something that uh, that would be enormously, enormously helpful. So that that would allow you to apply a kernel update, so just a security patch or something to the host and resume the guests with just a minute or two of downtime, but without losing their state, unless the network connections time out or some external monitoring systems uh, detect their downtime because rebooting real hardware tends to be slow enough that the network uh, doesn't like it. Right. So okay. for example, uh, some load balancer or not state tracking could time out while the server reboots. But it's, I mean, I would assume that the, the, the guest knows that it's suspended. So it should not know how to resume, no? The, not necessarily. If, so if you take a look at something like VirtualBox or something, I know desktop virtualization, the guest mm -hmm. doesn't really get informed unless it uses the host integrations. Right, it has been that's, suspended. Yes, and that's, that's kind right. Of I, the I do idea that with my, because yeah. um, if you could shed all load, then why uh, preserve the memory instead of just rebooting it cleanly? I can see a lot of uh, use cases for this feature um, revolve around uh, organizational boundaries. Where basically one team, the platform team doesn't want to talk to the infrastructure team or the software team to the platform team or something. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a hosted service, sure. Again, um, the customer isn't integrated into your management tools. Right. Daniel, there are a few Proxmox users here what did you say they get right and perhaps wrong and Beehive could do differently? Um, well, it's sort of along the same lines of what I was saying is that it's, is, is that it, it, is, it is sort of a flex and it's less, it, it's less valuable than it sounds at first because of Why the, is that? Because it's of the reason it super stuff. clear. Uh, because you know, like like it was said before, the the um, you know the the CPUs pretty much have to have to match, or the you know, or uh, migration isn't isn't going to work, and that's something that Proxmox, uh, at least as far as I know, I'm not a Proxmox user. Um, I, I dabbled with it very very briefly, um, but it it is it it purports to be able to perform live uh, suspends and live migrations. Um, I assume it's just a factor of, you know, KVM plus ZFS and not much else. Right. And that um, sounds like a caveat that most solutions have regardless, no? Yeah. Okay. Right. I, and I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's equal to better than or worse than the way VMware handles it. I can tell you with matched pairs of VM systems, this worked. Did I ever use it successfully at a time that I really needed to? Nope, yeah. <laughs> not, not much. Once or twice, once or twice. And it probably wasn't worth the planning to be, to be totally honest. But there are a million situations now where, uh, you know, now that I'm running a larger infrastructure that I need to get a box off, or it would be preferable to get a box off of a host before, I did something significant to the host. Evacuation, I guess. Usually evacuation. On the, from the VMware perspective, I can say that um, what they'll do is they'll, you have to be on the same uh, manufacturer. So you have to be all Intel or all AMD within your cluster. And then within that, it will, say, okay, this is the minimum processor that we can use features for. And if you have one higher than that, it's okay, but it won't use any of the higher features. Um, how do they deal with feature removal, something like an Alder Lake, desktop CPU lacking, uh, AVX 512, 
over it's newer. Um, or uh, AMD removing 3D now instructions from Ryzen. That's a good question. I'm, I, I haven't. It's not uh, strictly monotonously uh, growing feature set. I haven't, I, I haven't it, yet encountered I can, the removal ones. Hmm? Okay, I can speak a little bit to the VMware, what's called the CPU compatibility issue. And basically is what they have is they have the ability for each VM to be told what CPU features it can see. And it's generally implemented as a uh, match and mask situation. And is what you do is you create your VMs with a what's called a common subset of all the CPUs in your cluster. Now your cluster does have to be either all Intel or all AMD. You can't migrate across that. But as long as you create your VMs with a subset of what all of your CPUs can handle in the cluster, you can migrate a VM to any member of the cluster. It also checks that if you try to migrate a VM onto a node that does not have the required features, it won't let you. It just goes, these features are missing. I can't migrate that VM to there. But as long as that node is capable of supporting the common subset or the subset of that VM, and you don't even have to have all your VMs using the same subsets, it will be allowed to migrate there. Is that why so KVM gives you like 40 CPU types? Or is that unrelated? That's not totally unrelated. They actually, KVM migration does use the ability and you can with KVM, do the same thing. You can specify a subset of features visible to your VM. Um, but I think the KVM stuff came from QEMU and that because it's emulating CPUs, it knows how to emulate a whole bunch of different CPU types. And that's where I think KVM just inherited that. So, Surprisingly, this hasn't come up over the years. What might that look like in Beehive to say that guest three doesn't have feature B? Uh, I guess just- uh, for example, the, the, if, Let's say you want to run something like a Plex server in a VM. Totally reasonable to do. Also reasonable that uh, the FFM pack inside uh, the virtual machine uh, uses the vector extensions to uh, achieve reasonable speed for transcoding. So now if you have a nice AVX 512 system and a freshly optimized FFM pack release, which hopefully in a year or so finally makes use of those instructions and <laughs> you migrate off your old system and, and onto a new, um, uh, Intel system, which uh, suddenly disabled this feature because the uh, e troublesome efficiency course lacked the latest vector extensions. Now uh, your uh, FFM pack transcoding session would just uh, die with an illegal instruction because the new host CPU doesn't know how to uh, execute uh, this uh, or that instruction. So this is the uh, the more, more common case is that you implement some form of masking, which I do uh, vaguely remember from one of these calls, is implemented that uh, Beehive only exposes some of the CPU features to the guest. So it masks off what things it doesn't know how to preserve. And I think AVX2 is supported, but nothing newer, which increases the uh, state which has to be preserved. So there should be some uh, CPU feature masking. So if AVX 512 was working perfectly, would there be a clear use case for disabling it for guests that don't so need it? it? You, uh, the use case, for example, for masking off, or it used to be a few years ago that you would mask off AVX uh, 2 because you still had some, I don't know, Sandy Bridge based Xeon servers. And then if you uh, define the lowest common denominator feature set, uh, you could migrate your CPUs at least 
within one CPU vendor. Sure. And you lost a little bit of performance, but you gained the option of migrating between a larger pool of uh, hosts. Okay. So then just for something actionable, if we wanted that support in Beehive, would we just have a set of flags to enable and disable features? Um, I don't know if it's configurable, but it, something along those lines exists, but I think it has a static set of allowed. Uh, right. Oh, no features. question it's static, but so if so, that were to be made dynamic. Uh, it would be a, a wish list. large bit mask of feature flags. Right. The VM, VMware calls it the CPU compatibility mask. Yeah. Mask, okay. Yeah, it's a, and if you if you want some more information about how ESXi deals with this stuff, a good set of Google term is just VMware CPU compatibility. And that will pull up several different articles, including an old KB1991, which is when this all started happening. That goes back into ESXi 3.5. But, yeah, I recall um, it being in three five. Yeah, it's it's been there. It's the compatibility stuff has been there for a long time, and that you could even you could using the compatibility mask you could hide host features from guests, and sometimes that was used to run guests that didn't like these new host features or had bad implementations of those features. Okay, that's pretty tangible. But yeah, it would actually, the, most of the code to do it is already in Beehive because we already, there's already some hiding of host capabilities from gas. So some of the code is there to mask out um, return values that you get from CPU ID and, and MSR reading. So this might be called configurable feature ma masking? Well, I don't know why we need to invent new names. It, oh, what? It's, it's, a, it's a CPU masking? compatibility mask. Okay. Got it. CPU Thank compatibility you. mask. <laughs> Beautiful. Is what? Other wish list I items. If you want to Go look ahead. at what your systems are, are supporting, you can look into the uh, dmask.boot file to uh, get a decoded form of those bit masks. Where does one find that? Well, uh, run dmask.boot. And uh, during boot up, FreeBSD decodes all uh, feature bits it knows about. The features, cool. features to AMD features, AMD features to structured extended features and so on. It's uh, almost the first thing the kernel prints during a boot. Uh, oh, right, right, right. Yes, of course. Uh, so after the CPU colon, the next few lines. Before the uh, real and available memory is listed. Mm. Uh, Papa, you said VMask? Or is that only when virtualized? No, no. I'm looking at a hardware system. It's D message, D M E S G. Oh, oh, yeah. The D message includes. Yeah, there's those, there's okay, a copy. Fine. There's a copy of of the of boot the, time oh, one stored yes, in bar course. run. I I thought there'd be something, uh, a la carte. But oh, fine, fine. Yes, granted. That yeah, that's standard behavior. Cool. Okay. I do believe I do believe there is a syscuddle that'll get you that too. Ah, uh, that is easy to determine. There's even a VTX one, uh, a specific. Okay, yeah, great, love it. Other ideas, topics, you name it. Everything we just discussed in Illumos. Of course, and Patrick, again, is doing quite well on a lot of that. Oh, and I, I, of course, I'll corner Josh. Uh, 
John and ask him how he's doing on the uh, Max V CPU, but he's been plugging along quite nicely and hopefully that's going to land sooner rather than later. Um, I don't think that's an issue on Lumos, but I could be wrong. Um, I think our CPU limit is much higher. Right. I don't know if that was done by making it truly dynamic, which is what I recall he's working on, or making it just raising the static number. Right. Oh, interesting. Rodney, I'm only seeing a snippet of the kernel buffer as its own kernel.message buff as a sys cuddle, but I'm not seeing specifically a list of features. So one could, I guess, parse it out. Yeah, I couldn't find it. <clears throat> Anywho, we lost Levi in a problem. I'll probably talk to him later. Small world. Um, Daniel, going down your list as, as a, a gleaming example of a production user, keep gleaming. <laughs> I'm basically a baby Tubnor, <laughs> right? Uh, what's his, his fleet's, I think, literally uh, 20 times as large as mine. Anyway. Um, what about disk resizing and adding that disks dynamically and you name it? Do you bump into that much? I, I don't bump into it too much because, you know, just because the, I mean, I, I would love to throw on a CD. I think I was thinking a lot about things that that lots of people run into. So, like throwing a throwing a CD on the on a into a beehive. That's that's definitely a feature that's that's immature relative to to other systems, right? Like, I mean, it's it's not a it's not a showstopper because you can always you can pretty much always do that with with the network um, uh, protocol, sorry. but. But like not to be able to throw an ISO into um, um, into Beehive, or you it's, can. It's not, if it's possible, is is it? You can. How do you do it? Well, Jan gave uh, a great demo recently. But go ahead, Jan. Uh, oh, what sorry. What does work <laughs> is uh, what which already works even if it's seldom used is to use the Cam target layer, so the VIRTIO SCSI support. Mm -hmm. And then you can use uh, the target layer admin tools to uh, expose or hide uh, logical unit numbers. Um, so you, you would have to introduce the uh, file or uh, existing SCSI target to this uh, access port. I'm currently dealing with writing some tooling around that. The problem is that, free, uh, that Beehive with IO SCSI does not uh, send hot plug notifications to the guest. So the guest still has to scan, rescan the bus. Right. So that's, uh, that's not, some that's not going to be. Guests are expected or almost required to rescan the bus. So just injecting an error. A harmless error could be a workaround to get guests to lock some warning and then rescan the bus. But that's not a clean solution. Right. That's so. That's that's not something that we could do a, a four-line wiki page on how to attach a ISO to a to a running um, gas. That's so, not something we could do. Uh, you can. The running guest will, but it will take some time until the guest uh, rescans the bus. So, right. so even without errors, I've found out that at least three BSD guests, after a minute or two, the device is suddenly noticed. But right, and I, I guess the reason why that other packages do it is because of their, their built-in tools packages. Uh, they do it know. in different mm -hmm. ways. Uh, for example, the, their uh, SATA emulation sometimes supports hot plugging devices, which is lacking from, from FreeBSD. Uh, because the uh, FreeBSD um, SATA emulation is, uh, at least uh, the Beehive FreeBSD SATA emulation, isn't dynamic enough to do this. Right. I think you could probably do it via NVMe as well. 
but that's only useful for modern guest systems, which do include NVMe drivers. This sounds like it's a stone's throw away from being able to attach any sort of uh, via SCSI, you can device read anything only, you right. want, yeah. uh, which is a SCSI uh, target. Right. So uh, if you're going back far enough in time, you can even find uh, Ethernet over SCSI encapsulations to uh, add 10 megabit Ethernet ports to uh, mid 90s laptops or something via SCSI port. So here's a thought. FreeBSD has dev control, which can knock off PCI devices. I wonder if that could be used to add devices with a little plumbing behind it. Uh, that's not really the problem here. Orthogonal. Adding disks doesn't require adding P, uh, PCI devices. Correct, but that and is drivers. an avenue to have a, a controller and a device in there. It shows up magically. Just a thought. So. And I think Rob Wing was working on some form of um, hot plug notifications, but I haven't heard anything lately. Uh, again, this is the only feature missing from Beehive right now isn't uh, as complex as um, PCI hot plugging or unplugging. It's just a message uh, for, from the virtual uh, SCSI controller to the guest that it's time to rescan the bus. That's from my limited understanding of SCSI implement, uh, documentation because some of that is hidden behind uh, T10 registration forms and so on. Um, yeah. Got it. Hmm. It could be as simple as if you're integrating it into your tooling as using an additional console interface to send a notification message to the guest, something like, uh, you could either be COM2 or a VIT.io console port. I think uh, KVM and um, QEMO do it this way, that they have an additional uh, VIT.io console inter, uh, TTY and the uh, QEMO uh, guest editions only read from this uh, virtual serial port for notifications from the host. And Beehive could do something similar. It should be more generic than a single byte of a serial port, but it would be enough for this. So do you have an example workaround? I recall using either sending a yes command or a true command to a, a device to wake it up, the exact context, but it doesn't apply. This isn't about noticing changes on an existing uh, geom um, provider, right? But about noticing the that a new device is available to be enumerated on the SCSI bus. I've dug through the uh, CTL and chem code, but it wasn't very approachable. <laughs> So, do you, but I trust people picture this working without relying on CTL. Am I, is um, that an accurate statement? So here's another disk image. There is no reason it why a, have a VM use grab CTL. hold of it. What's required is some nice tooling to, uh, to make use of CTL because everything but this notification is already there. Good the notification point. shouldn't be the hardest part. Did you ever benchmark the overhead of using CTL? Um, fast enough to max out my spinning disks. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I only have four uh, 3.5 inch disks. Uh, no, oh no, five of them in a RAID Z1. So okay. my lab machine isn't the fastest uh, testing machines. So your tooling's coming along nicely, or you'll have a demo at in in Europe. Uh, yeah, in Euro so that should happen. Cool. But I didn't have the time last week to work on it. Understood. Because I do want to have some nice tooling to 
reconfigure the S6 RC service manager, recompile the database and do it all correctly instead of just messing with the state. Dynamically, I want to update the specification, compile it, apply it. Cool. Let's see, we're at 45 minutes in. Any other wish list items, magic wand items? I think I've got something that's a magic wand, not a magic wand item. It's oh, not please. that big of a deal and scares a lot of people who are who are new to you know, Beehive and ZFS. And that is that um, uh, Beehive doesn't play super nice with ZFS Arc and will run a machine aground uh, if, if Arc isn't, isn't reserved. And, and this, this usually happens when dealing with a number of large, uh, large VMs. But I think probably everybody on this call has started a bunch of VMs, ran out of swap and saw processes die. And no, I... the solution to this is to set uh, ArcMax. And that's, the, that's pretty much the only, the only thing you can do is to reserve the memory in advance. Why would it be difficult for, um, for Beehive to just say, hey, I'm gonna invest a, sna a snatch 32 gigs of memory. You better get ready for this. <laughs> um, because you, this is- you. You can alleviate your issues with ArcMax by using wired memory in Beehive, and that simply says allocate the memory for this VM and wire it in. And if I can't get it, the VM doesn't start. And right, so while trying yes, I could... it, you still put very high pressure on the Arc, so the kernel will run into very high memory pressure if you try to start a wired guest. Then right, I, I, I definitely, to find I've the memory definitely and lost. Downsize, uh, among others, the ZFS arc. Yeah, I've definitely but lost. I've lost jails. I've lost beehive. Like I had a um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Pudri in a jail, and when it it launched oh, yes. because it didn't have ZFS, uh, the ZFS arc wasn't wasn't set. It was competing and it would start killing off VMs. It took me a while to figure out what was going on. Even um, worse, if you're on a NUMA system with more than one uh, memory domain, the ZFS arc is NUMA aware. So uh, while the normal kernel uh, UMA allocator is uh, memory domain aware, it will the arc sometimes to say, well, this other memory domain where kernel doesn't want any uh, allocation from still has space. So I refuse to give up my cache. Hmm. Yeah. Fort, just, just to be sure, keep in mind that the arc is now dynamic. So you fortunately don't have to like reboot to set a max. So you could have some intelligence just... there communicating either supplier demand. So and yeah. But right. Yeah, I, I mean, I just right feel like Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, set, setting arc max is what uh, is is what we all do, probably. But I, I just I just think that there's got to be a, a way because like this doesn't this doesn't tend to happen as much with with jails and things running on the the host system as as Beehive because it's consuming all of that memory all at once. Uh, so can it just say, uh, hey? CFS, do your laundry <laughs> and get get ready. Like, uh, is, is there something we can do to uh, to to uh, you know make this easier for somebody who just wants to run a couple of VMs on their you know home workstation or something? Um, you can, but you could do it in twenty lines of shell scripting around in your startup script. But the problem is that this is a fragile interface because you're basically incrementing and decrementing the uh, SysCTL. Right. Which is system wide. That's a pretty yeah, dramatic right. so of course, that's authority. Always the problem. Uh, what would be useful to, would be to add a, I don't know if you can have a dynamic SysCTL or something, or how you would uh, expose it to user space, but basically to add named subtractions from the arc marks basically yeah leave the default arc uh, 
size in, but subtract eight gigs from it or under this name. And right, I have, a, I have some, a script that uh, does exactly, yeah, I have a script that does some exactly that script before I fire my VMs. Where you, uh, maybe via a pseudo device where you open it, uh, write a number to it, or maybe do, it, I don't know, an ioctal on it, whatever, to uh, decrement the arc. Daniel, is that something you can share? Oh yeah, sure. It's dumb, but I, <laughs> sure, I can send my dumb trick, script. Yeah. But, I, but actually, that's that's a that's a really good point. Like if the if if like VM Beehive or something, you know, the popular the popular tools that are used for for management, mm -hmm. th those are extremely likely to be used by people who are new to Beehive anyway. So if they just simply you know did did the sanity check and mm -hmm. threw a warning when people fired them, I think that would be enough education that, that anybody would need because- It's a related problem which has been discussed several times on this call, namely uh, double buffering between guest and ZFS. Where uh, unless you set the primary cache to uh, metadata only, uh, ZFS will try to cache the guest uh, disk content again. Right, a really important sanity check there. That's that's pretty easy to look up in advance. I think that that maybe just some communication by the by the tools. And this doesn't this might not be something that needs to go. Well, actually, maybe it should go into the eye control. Like because you know, because the, the, these are important enough, I think, to to you know, we we throw errors for less. <laughs> So, I, so. My, my suggestion quite some time ago to, I can't remember if it was Peter or John, is, is that VM or Beehive should basically apply back pressure on the arc or in some, in some mechanism, when you fire up a VM, it needs your available, your total available memory used to decide the size of the arc should be decreased by the amount of memory that the, the, the VM is allocated. And it would be trivial to do this in the kernel when a VM starts up and when it goes away, it would be, it would increment and decrement the right global and back pressure could be called uh, uh, into the uh, arc to tell the arc to recalculate your maximum size. And and that would basically only the problem is like oh no that's too ugly and so oh well that's not a bad idea. so it has been it has been suggested and rejected by the incumbent bi maintainers. Um, one of the problems I foresee is that um, basically the VMs should be a bias to the uh, default value or the current value. That's exactly what I was suggesting is, is that the sum, the sum of the gas memory usage should be applied as a bias to the total available memory that is used in the calculation for the size of the arc. And refusing this results in an even uglier solution, namely the better user space management tools re-implementing this logic with all the race conditions uh, implied then. And I don't even know if there's a way uh, for user space to find out if uh, the new arc uh, limit has been applied. So when the cache has been shrunk to the new limit, because our, you, you have to delay the VM start until the arc has been reduced, which can involve flushing tens of gigabytes uh, to spinning disks. Yeah, I think I think you can actually get the current arc usage from a syscuttle. So you could actually okay, so spin watch could it. Pull until it's I think you could spin watch for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Because it can take time to free up. I, I've seen it. Yeah, it can take a long time. Brilliant. <laughs> That's amazing. No. Especially if you have, uh, because uh, evicting the cache does not have the highest uh, allocation priority for IOPS uh, in the um, VDEF layer in ZFS. So what could happen is that higher priority uh, op operations like synchronous writes or something already take up most of your um, uh, IOPS per transaction. And you only get what's left for your async cache. Within ZFS itself? 
Yes. Ah, good point. Um, so the, I think there was work to at least make it a per VDEV setting to support a mixed uh, flash and spinning disk pools better because at least in FreeBSD 13, as far as I know, these the settings like how many IOPS per, uh, per transaction for resilvering and so on are global CCDLs. And if you tune it for a flash pool, it will result in terrible latencies for your spinning disk pool. And in the other direction, it will leave most of the available uh, bandwidth unutilized because the queues are too short. Thank you, Rodney. It sounds like you have to call to jump on, but that was great input. Definitely appreciated. Um, interesting on, yeah, the, the priority. I, I can foresee other users than just a beehive for this feature. So uh, it shouldn't be part of Beehive, but past part of OpenZFS, because uh, at least on Linux, I suspect that uh, their hypervisors have uh, <laughs> a use for a similar feature. And I trust uh, that uh, databases have similar issues where you might have a massive cache Depends maintained the by database. the database and then the host does its thing. Go ahead. Somebody might want to go look at Linux. They've probably already fixed this issue in some way, either either applying back pressure or. Um... I have seen guides for Linux uh, ZFS users, which do mention limiting the arc size if you intend to run certain kinds of services, among others, virtual machines, but also some uh, databases which do their own user space buffering, while other databases like Postgres make heavy use of the arc. Right. So for example, Postgres has its uh, anonymous cache area for things like a temporary join uh, map or something. And then the block cache is just the file system cache, in, which allows uh, Postgres to share the uh, file system buffer cache between all of its worker processes because it's an old fashioned uh, forking. Hmm. Network service. And I guess I haven't heard Proxmox people complaining about blowing themselves up. So maybe they've implemented their own strategy because they definitely have root on ZFS, which is moderately well implemented. And one super quick story from the Hambug call. Someone found that doing a port scan of his VMs, maybe even just the host would blow away VMs because he probably ran into, had a memory collision with the ARC. So. That was unexpected. I that did was on true news. Hot scan uh, consume that many resources. Not a clue, but he's investigating. Because the kernel shouldn't be allocating that much data structures for a pot scan, uh, that many. Well, it sounds but, like a sin, sin cache blow up. But the sin cache couldn't, shouldn't get large enough to. Uh, he, he didn't say what the anything. guess was. <laughs> Okay. Um, I may have it noted, but it was a month or two ago. But yeah, that was the first theory to come up is like, why do my VMs blow up when I port scan? I believe the host, but maybe it was the VMs themselves. Oh, but they'd have a fixed memory allocation. Anyway, uh, I told them to watch the arc regardless. Ah, that is a very good point. Mr. Bell that you brought up, thank you. Cause yeah, that's one of the classic, oops, why is why is stuff blowing up on me? And yeah. Um, as far I as- oops yesterday. <laughs> there you go. As uh, far yes, as uh, tracking the arc size to see if your stuff has been applied. I obviously don't know BSD well, but I know on the Solaris side, we have case stats that we can query for that stuff. Yes, handled in sys controls on FreeBSD, and I, I trust are pretty similar. Yeah, thank you, ZFS team. Um, oh, one thought you definitely want some, I don't know, delay such that if someone is constantly flapping a VM, rebooting it, shutting it down, starting it up again, you name it. You wouldn't want it to constantly be flooding the kernel with, okay, change the max, you know, change, change it again, uh, change it, change it, change it, change it. Well, is that- Why uh, is, is it the kernel's task to stop root from being stupid? <laughs> well, fair enough, fair enough. 
maybe it's an optional, uh, you know, throttle. And you would then raise the ZFS maximum and you, it would only be a lot of work to lower it again when the cache had a, had a time Correct. to grow. Correct. So if you just restart a guest, that's why I wanted to decouple it from uh, Beehive because a smart uh, management tool, if it's just restarting the guest, could leave the reservation in place. Yep. Uh, it would make sense to expose it as a pseudo device where you would have basically arc reservations where you would decrement from it. So, so to yeah. what degree is this a beehive question and to what degree it's just a facility on any given OS with ZFS? It would be a question for open ZFS to do the right thing and uh, expose a feature so that a beehive front end could be implemented cleanly to do the right thing without any fragile locking and incrementing and decrementing a single global pointer via SysCTL, counter via SysCTL. Right now we have one SysCTL and you have to do a read modify write on it to do a, to reserve main memory. How would, would something like Beehive talk have some to kind of, ZFS? Uh, slash dev uh, arc reservations, and then you directory in slash dev and open a file and write the amount you want to reserve into it or do an ioctal on it. And to delete the reservation, you would just uh, delete the file or something, a pseudo file, so that you have a clean file system based interaction. Of course, you could add new system calls as well if you're afraid of uh, it, but uh, putting it under a pseudo device is probably the um, easiest for user space applications to make use of. It doesn't require linking against special libraries and so on. It's just under a what device you said? Uh, my idea, my work. Uh, idea would be to expose this uh, ZFS arc limit bias uh, API uh, um, as a directory in the uh, slash dev pseudo file system. Interesting, okay. And have a named reservation because then you can actually show uh, the user if someone is wondering why is my uh, ZFS cache so small you could have a CCTL listing. These are your reservations uh, for guests or, what, or databases or whatever. They uh, add up to uh, this bias. Um, you have config, the default arc limit is this minus the bias, this much remains. Instead of having a single global limit with no explanation how you ended up with a value. And I think the SysCTL doesn't even have a way to do an atomic uh, add or subtract. And annoyingly, it doesn't take human parsable variables. It takes like page size multiplied by whatever number you want to do. And I've sure, got some that, scripts to calculate that a, just because it's such a pain. <laughs> that's annoying for interactive use without proper tooling. Correct. Um, but, but just to be clear, if it was in DevFS, what might the notifications look like? What notifications? When, a, when a VM starts up, how does it tell the kernel that, hey, it would create a file, uh, and if, uh, in the easiest to use case, it would just write a number into a pseudo file. And DevFS is writable? I should know this. Hmm? Okay. The directory permissions apply. So uh, probably either root, uh, probably writable only by root, readable by group and everyone, or list and readable unless you change the permissions, but this is a uh, host operating specific. I suspect that uh, other OpenZFS users require other 
integrations with their platforms, device file system. So Andrew, is there a DevFS on a Lumos? I was looking at some storage devices and I saw a whole lot of entries like the good old days. I don't know if that would quite work everywhere. Oh, and then um, what would one do on say Hyper-V on Windows or something? I don't know, on ZFS. Go ahead. Uh, commit suicide. Huh? Well, yeah, but after, before that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure how that would how that would work. I mean, obvi obviously, there's a whole dev tree. I haven't had to muck about with it too much. The alternative would be to have a single well-known device and have several ioctals on it. This is the classic way of doing it, but it. Then you need special purpose tools to modify and uh, inspect the state instead of just having a directory. Yep, cool. Both okay. is possible. I would prefer having a directory as an operator. I can see why a developer thinks this is overkill and just adding a few ioctals would be easier on them. <laughs> If they uh, if the it comes with a script friendly tool and a C uh, library, okay, works as well. I mean, it, for us, it certainly wouldn't be the first thing in Dev that has a directory. <laughs> no, for example, uh, VMM has a directory. Yep. And uh, PCI Express virtual functions uh, have a directory and file descriptors have their directory, which is even a sub mount if you want to have it dynamically, the file descriptor file system. Right, right, right. Which isn't mounted by default on FreeBSD, but can be quite useful when combined with uh, FXEC VE. Okay, we are at seven minutes past the hour. Any other hot topics requests for the trip? And we, I, I, we touched on the CUDA request from IRC earlier, but not, didn't go very far with that. I guess someone's having trouble with a CUDA device or PCI pass through. Uh, they're probably the first one to try it. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Um, you had mentioned earlier the whole thing with um, being able to, to resize disks live, that would yes, make sir. me very, very happy. Oh, resizing disks live is uh, also possible. That should probably even generate a notification. The, what's missing uh, notification support is, uh, I think uh, John is working on adding this to NVMe and uh, VIT.io block device, but I don't know that made it to FreeBSD current completely we write uh, kq uh, notifications have been added in head and uh, event types in the uh, beehive event loop to watch uh, v notes so that in can't be much land. that's missing for resize notifications okay and that's a i guess a patrick question he might have some something up his sleeve but on the Luma. You're asking uh, about Beehive on uh, um, Zolaris, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, my my first concern is on the Lumos. Okay, because uh, all of these changes, I think, have only been uh, committed to FreeBSD current. Is that easy to find or link to? Uh, the, I don't mean current. The but, fabricator uh, the does have some reviews for it. Okay. Let's see if I can... uh, the thing to look for to find one of the involved commits would be to look for a KQ uh, V node support. So the okay. uh, the um, macros defining the uh, 
v filter index. So let's find out. Trying that. Let's see. While grabbing for this, I just found out that uh, the uh, block device support in Beehive doesn't use async IO, but does uh, PWID uh, in a blocking thread. Is there, is there a reason why it doesn't use async IO and let the kernel thread pool handle this problem for it? So the block if proc function. Yeah, I found a few V node uh, reviews or comment on a review, but it's something. Some of it has already been committed. Yeah. With Gree and Mark and John, go team. Yeah. So uh, there is um, this this, uh, this review. Inform guests of namespace resizing. And it does reference a commit. Cool. And Andrew, I noticed that Patrick is surprisingly active on IRC. You may want to drop him a line and say, hey, what's, how, how, what is the state of notification? Because I suspect that's pretty interesting to them. <clears throat> These uh, are the um, reviews for cool. GitIO block devices. I just know that it's super interesting to me because right now, you know, my workflow for this consists of calling somebody up and saying, hey, I need to take your server down for a few minutes while I <laughs> increase your disk size because you're out of space again. And of course, you don't want to migrate them over to uh, running an iSCSI initiator <laughs> inside the VM. No. That, that, that I'll just concatenate them. You'll be fine. <laughs> We, we do not want to do that. <laughs> but yeah, so, and then wait for them, then wait for them to email me back, which could take days. But uh, Daniel, do you have any more uh, basically production user requests? Or I'm problems? sure I'll think of 40 after I hang up. But... Yeah, drop me a line <laughs> through whatever means. Yeah. Just tweet the heck out of it. But and you know, I mean, thanks are so much. It's incredible how far it's come since I started. I think it was 2019. Whenever Windows support became pretty solid on on AMD and newer Intel, that's when I started using Beehive. Yeah. And it's incredible how far it's come. I mean, it's it's really. I mean, there's there's almost no reason for me to use anything else at this point, which is just completely different than it was. It was a little bit of a struggle. <laughs> Back then, Did you but not anymore. Down your struggle somewhere? What, uh, no, I'm what, I'm starting I'm starting to, to do that. Yeah, I'm starting the I'm memoirs. Starting to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, but, uh, better late than never. But I'm I'm starting to to take more notes and journal about those things. So I'd have to go through chat logs to figure out because... where I was banging my head. But nothing I've really talked about today. I mean, except for the arc thing. Um, do you share that script if it's handy? So, just, oh yeah, right. Uh, just either to show just, what to do or what not to do, but it's still it's valuable to the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So just guesses based on configuration directories how much uh, arc you need to reserve for your VMs. So oh. yeah, I'll ship that. Up. I'll ship that out. Okay. okay well, thank you, everyone. Bit. I'll say that. Um, last yeah, thoughts, you. last ideas, last requests. Yeah, I wish I could uh, be in. Where, where are you going, Vienna? That would be awesome yeah. to see you there. Yes. Does yeah. anyone know? Well, one uh, of these. Go ahead, uh, if, uh, Anton, Jan. 
um, your BSD can will be recorded this year? Uh, Euro? Uh, yes. yes, I talked to Patrick McNamara, just uh, not McNamara. Uh, 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 I, I should, Patrick M. <laughs> just last night, BSD TV. Uh, okay. They are rigging up and so uh, bring some cameras along and just as spares. And so they do have fancy, fancy rigs for the main conference, but he's also helping out with the dev summit. So that should be streamed. Uh, um, McAvoy, thank you. <laughs> Spacing his name was late last night. Anyway. Well, let's call it there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just keep it coming on Twitter or otherwise in the run up to this, but those are all very, very good points about you know, what niceties we would like to see before the next major releases of each OS. Okay, safe travels on everyone. I will call it at 1015 Pacific, but I can hang around a few minutes more. I'll probably Cut the recording for that. Well, I am going okay. to head out. I will talk Great. to you all later. Take care. Yeah, you too. Okay. Thank you, Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Bye. Take care.